Yeah, looking forward to, to being here, John. Well, I, I thought when we were doing the prep call, the most interesting thing we discussed was the idea of the influencer versus the final decision maker, because you're marketing equipment that the CIO is going to eventually approve the purchase of, or someone at the VP or SVP level. How much do you market to younger people throughout the organization who influence that final decision? Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, it's definitely something that we're, we're always focused on whether we're doing kind of persona based um, <clears throat> campaigns or more account based company targeted campaigns. We're, we're thinking about not just the final decision maker, but you know, our, and our personas represent this too, as we're thinking about, you know, more of the senior IT decision maker or business decision maker versus the influencer segments underneath that. Um, so it's definitely something that we're, we are always, I would say, including, I mean, you know, certainly there might be cases where there's a prioritization need to choose one over the other, but where, you know, budget aside, um, it's something that we find critical. And, you know, I think to your point on not just thinking about it from a persona standpoint, but from a human standpoint as well, what those younger audiences who are growing into the decision-making roles are, you know, how they conduct research might be very different than more of the traditional, um, you know, what I, would, what I would refer to as more of like the traditional B2B model, providing white papers to, you know, to, for someone to download, to provide contact information. While that is still a piece of what we have, to, you know, what we do, and, you know, some segments do still, you know, think about research in that way. The reality is a lot of the younger segments are not. So we need to think about, you know, quote unquote, snackable content, more, you know, video, what channels are they actually looking to receive information on, not just on our own properties, but in third party environments as well. So it's definitely playing in not to just, you know, that final targeting decision, but as far as how we're thinking about content production, media placement, where, you know, where each of the touch points kind of, you know, sit does differ a lot as we're thinking about those different audiences. Well, what is the goal of the snackable content? Is it, is it to eventually get them to the white paper or to the case study? I think it could be both. I mean, I think you're going to find some, you know, some opinions on, you know, that lead gen mindset, like everything has to, at some point, get to a, to a point where we know who we're talking to so that they, that this is someone that could actually um, be picked up by our sales organization. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of truth around, you know, that is the concrete action that we need to get. So that, you know, snackable content alone will not achieve that. But at the same time, we need to recognize a lot of our, our audience, maybe within digital channels, will never get to that known outcome, but, you know, but they need to have the right pieces of content to you know, understand what we're trying to sell, you know, some of the new strategic positioning that we're putting into the market. And the snackable content can do that without you know, assuming that a white paper is the next step. So it, it has to be both. I mean, of course, you know, anyone on our side will, you know, will, will say having you know, a known contact is, is critical and you know, a critical KPI for us to continue, but it can't be the only way that we're thinking about um, our, our campaigns, because that's you know going to be a bit of an outdated way of thinking about how our audience actually wants to engage, or parts of our audience actually wants to engage with us. What kind of content are you creating, and are are you creating it, or are you having agencies create it? So it's it's both. Um, we're very much in a in a hybrid model right now. We we have you know been working with our external agency partners, um, you know the you know the current group for the last uh, you know five six years. At the same time, for different content pieces, um, you know, we're we're managing some of that production ourselves. Um, and then, you know, a third pillar would be you know thinking about as you know how we work with publisher partners, you know, content partners to you know co-brand and co-create content together that isn't just our own. Um, so it's, you know, it's a mix of all all of those three pillars together. What's a, what's a success story or an example of a collaboration with a publisher that you're particularly proud of that you would, that you would cite as something that worked well? Yeah, we've done, you know, for a number of years, we've, we've created different content programs um, with, with The Atlantic. I um, mean, yeah, I think one of the you know, key, key points has been finding a publisher partner that, especially for you know, a, a category as our own, um, you know, with a niche target audience and a very specific way of of talking and you know, depth of understanding that's required to 
even at the brand level, talk about what we're trying to say. You know, it, it, it requires a unique partner to be able to speak in that voice that um, feels, you know, feels relevant to how we are talking in the market um, and not, you know, you know, transparently something that's not, that doesn't, you know, feel flimsy as a you know, replacement for how we would be talking about it ourselves. So, you know, with the Atlantic, for example, you know, we've created a number of different, um, you know, video series to help with some of the, you know, positioning of us, but also just to kind of, to help with topics that need some education. You know, we're, as a business, we're pivoting from more of a hardware sales motion to a services sales motion, which is a very different way for us to be working with, you know, talking to our customers for sales to be, you know, talking to our customers. So for that, you know, for that type of significant change in the business model entirely, it requires a lot of education as well. So some of these deeper content programs just help put some of those new ideas into the market at a, you know, in, in, a, in an entertaining way as well for, you know, a broad mix of our personas to, um, to find entertaining and educational. And then, so we've talked about publishers, but let's talk about platforms. Which platforms are you putting your content on? And, and what are the formats that you that you do on the platforms, the major platforms, of course? Um, I, you know, I would assume LinkedIn is probably the best for you. I mean, is that, is that assumption right or wrong? Yeah, that, that's, you know, it's certainly fair. LinkedIn certainly has some benefits, not just from a, you know, the type of content that we can place there, but the type of specificity that we can get with who we're who we're speaking to, whether it's at a you know account level or at a persona level, you know there's there's no doubt that that is going to be the richest um, type of targeting that we can get from a platform, you know, from a third party type of uh, targeting standpoint. So that's definitely in the mix. But with that said, you know we are you know we've been on Facebook and Instagram, and you know we use Twitter. Um, you, know, perhaps, you know, perhaps not as deep in social platforms as a consumer brand might, but we're always trying to speak at that human level at the end of the day. Um, so we're, you know, we have an openness to having that mix of platforms, both in terms of just where we want to be present, but also, you know, the different platforms, um, you know, are going to invite different types of conversations, whether it's, you know, deep, you know, longer form video content, you know, maybe more appropriate to distribute through, through LinkedIn. Um, you know, shorter form teaser content, maybe for some of the other, other, other channels. And then, you know, on top, on, you know, on top of the social platforms, we obviously have our own properties. And then we, you know, we, with some of the, you know, more endemic tech publishers, we might, you know, build deeper, you know, content distribution programs into those, um, you know, into those uh, properties as well. Who, who do you consider the most endemic tech publishers these days? Um, I mean, we're we're working with companies like IDG, with with Tech Target, um, with with Spiceworks, for, you know, for a lot of our you know smaller mid-sized uh, business conversations. So there's you know there there's a you know of course there's a deeper set from there, but um, those are a few that we you know have always had deep partnerships with. When we, you know, staying on this theme of of places to put media, when we talked, you were particularly excited about CTV. Uh, seems like everybody's excited about CTV. Tell tell us a bit about how you're working in that space. And by the way, if you've got questions, you can put them in the Q and A, and I'll make sure to kind of work your questions into Adam. Yeah, as CTV. You know, I, I think one of the early success stories for us was, especially as a B two B brand, was how early on we we had the internal willingness to to test in CTV. And I think one of the one of the benefits as a digital first publisher is, you know, we don't, you know. Of course, we have our, our linear in, you know, investments and offline investments for more specific campaigns and moments in time. But by and large, we are a very digital first investment model, digital first marketing model. And what that has allowed, you know, what CTV has then allowed for us is to elevate our, you know, always on digital programs up to, you know, the impactful tele, you know, television formats. Um, that we wouldn't, you know, typically have been able to do with our with our digital budget. So you know, I think, as opposed to you know, a lot of marketers who view CTV as an extension of their television, in, you know, investment for us, it's been you know the reverse. It's been a, you know, how can we you know make our digital investment as impactful as possible and use you know CTV as a you know as a main channel for us to 
get the benefit of of the higher impact format that it that it allows um, with the specificity and all the data intelligence that we would be able to get within all parts of our of our digital investment. So it's it's definitely been you know as you know concerning as the scale is increasing over the years, it you know is becoming more and more of a you know core pillar of our investment versus you know the first several years were more of a um, you know a testing model for us. And are you using a DSP to do these CTV buys, or are you going directly to Roku, directly to Samsung? How, how are you doing the buying? It's both. Um, you know, I think if we're if we're talking about more of our always on efforts, we wherever possible, we we like to integrate into our into our DSP into our programmatic stack, um, but not at the expense of building those direct partnerships as well. So if we can set up you know, either you know. PMP or, or more of a guaranteed buy within our programmatic stack so that we have it integrated from a campaign standpoint. We like to do that, but obviously if there's inventory sources or direct partnerships or custom formats that we're not gonna be able to execute within our programmatic channels, we absolutely will build those direct programs as well. So it's it's both um, where, you know, where we need to. You know, it, it's, it seems to me coming out of the pandemic, and we'll talk a bit about the pandemic, that everybody is utterly obsessed more than ever with performance marketing and brand marketing has fallen even further out of favor um, from where it was before the pandemic. Where do you come down on this and how do you measure brand advertising if you do in fact keep it in your mix? Great question. I mean, and it's been, it's always a you know, different mix year to year with you know, some years having been more performance-based, some years being more brand-based you know, for those on the line who are not familiar, and actually, when I when I joined the organization back in 2015, the former Hewlett Packard was splitting into two organizations: the consumer side and the enterprise side. So, you know, for those early years of the new version of H of HP, of course, it was extensively um, weighted towards the brand side to you know allow our audience to know who this new you know HPE was. Um, you know, in some of the later years, it's you know kind of re reverted a bit back more towards the performance side. Um, I would say you know, it's, it's still a healthy mix for us. Um, yes, we can you know, talk about the, you know, the you know, re you know, reaction to the pandemic a bit, but um, you know, some of the earlier you know, response, you know, re internal um, response that we took to um, you know, the early stages of, of the situation was to pause where appropriate some more of the product messaging because we knew that we did have to elevate the message and be relevant to what our customers were going through at that point in time. Um, and then, you know, also, you know, some of the conversations that we're having now more specific to the business, we're, as I said before, we're going through this massive transformation from a hardware centric sales motion to a services centric, building out these, you know, new digital experiences that will sit on top of our, our product set. Um, and that's, you know, that's a big shift that a lot of our customers are still getting used to. Um, we're not, you know, we're not the only. And that requires, in, and, and, that, and that requires brand marketing, I assume. Exactly. That's, you know, that's what I was going to get. And like do, that. You, do you measure it with brand lift? How do you measure the efficacy of, of changing that mindset from hardware company to solutions company? Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of different versions of, of brand lift, whether it's our, our ongoing tracker um, with some of those you know, key perceptions that we know we have to shift. Or more of the you know, campaign specific ad effectiveness type of um, brand impact measurement that we would put in market. It's, it's a mix of those. Yeah, you know, I, I think even where appropriate in the brand investment, if we, you know, if there are high value digital engagements that we do want to drive, you know, that might be part of the KPI set. But that would certainly all be secondary to you know some of the bigger shifts, you know, perception shifts that we we have to drive as a business, and that's how we would judge success of those investments. Let's let's talk about the pandemic and you know walk us through your your budgetary pandemic journey. You know what you guys did in March, what you did halfway through the pandemic, what you're doing now. Yeah, so the you know the early stage obviously was us trying to assess the situation. You know with the the ambiguity that you know we as everyone did not know where it was going to go. Um, so we took you know as many advertisers took some cautious approaches to pause as much of our um, investment as we could for a short duration of time to decide, was it appropriate to have that investment in the market? 
Um, but ultimately, you know, the bigger um, initiative that we took was to actually just build out some new brands level campaign messaging to be appropriate and relevant for the, for the time. Um, you know, we, we, we dubbed it as our here to help initiative, but you know, specifically how we were helping our customer organizations respond to um, this time. And it, you know, it was, it was much more than just a campaign because there were truly some new, you know, product offerings like our Aruba business, wireless, um, wire, wireless offer, offerings that companies actually needed at, at that time to stand up you know, the new remote way of working. Mm -hmm. um, and also potentially we, you know, some new financial models to help our customers pay for investment that um, you know, perhaps they needed to kind of stagger out over time and you know, delay some payments to actually stand up new, um, new infrastructure during that time. So we had true relevant business offerings that the campaign sat on top of. And that became a bit more of our, you know, I would say short to midterm focus. We shifted a lot of our product product investment to that, to that message. Um, but I was, you know, and to, you know, to probably the mid to later stages, you know, we were, you know, ultimately reinvesting back into those critical product campaigns. Um, you know, of course we had, you know, maybe some decreases in total investment, but I would say it was a lot more of a message slash channel optimization than um, saying that we were going to cut out a huge chunk of our marketing investment in, in totality. And leading into this year, um, you know, we've certainly we've reinvested even more in some channels. Um, so overall, it's definitely as of now, you know, a bit more in a growth pattern again. Are you still doing a lot of linear television? I wouldn't say we're doing a lot. Um, you know, for we. We're, we're about to launch some new brand level initiatives where that will take a bigger focus. Um, it's not something that we do on an always on basis. It's definitely tied into either new, um, you know, our as a service message, you know, certainly requires that type of linear investment um, as well as, you know, any new brand initiatives that we're putting to market. So it's, it's there, but it's, you know, certainly a min minority percent of what we do. Let's, let's change gears and talk about agencies for a little bit. You, you've in-house quite a bit. Um, where, where do you stand now on the in-house versus the external agency? Yeah, um, definitely a topical conversation for us. You know, it's where a lot of our, you know, a lot of our um, you know, team has been focused this year. I, you know, I, I, I tend to shy away from a lot of the hype around in-housing. I, you know, I think some of the you know, headlines that full in-house teams have been built out that have 100% replaced agencies, I definitely think are, are a bit hyperbole. Um, and I, you know, while we've been in, in the midst of our own in-housing journey, it's always been a conversation on, this is a, you know, this is a, a hybrid model that we're optimizing and not necessarily new to this year, obviously a lot has been for us in the, in the last eight months. But even six years ago, when I was first starting the organization, we were having conversations on we need, you know, we want to take ownership of all of our platform and data contracts. So we, as the marketer, own all of our data. You know, we built out some new strategic functions in house that you know perhaps maybe were a bit more you know taking on some of that strategic responsibility versus what the agency might have been doing. Now we're working on some of the buying pieces. Um, so it's it's been a journey, um, but. Whether you know whether it's the end of this phase or the next phase of this that we're we're talking about for what we're planning for next year, it's going to always. I, you know, I think for us, it's always going to be a hybrid model. And you know, I would venture to say, I think for most marketers, maybe you know a few biggest spenders being the outliers. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a conversation on what is the right hybrid model versus saying how can we in house or why should we why should we in house. Does it cause tension with the agency, the partial hybrid? Because ideally, they wish you were doing everything with them the way that you that you used to six years ago. Yeah, I mean, of, of course, there are some of those difficult conversations initially to say why you're moving certain pieces in house. Yeah, you know, at, at the same time, I think there's an appreciation for why you're also saying that pieces of the business need to stay with the agency. Um, so it's you know certainly the managing that relationship is. Is difficult, um, but as you know, as long as you have the ability to be as transparent as as possible, and you know, commit to what the future of the relationship is, and not just what you're taking away, um, 
I think it's it's sustainable, but you know, it's not to say it's not without its challenges and um, you know, initial pushback. All right, people, please pop in some questions. I know that we've got some cheddar folks on the line, so so you're certainly required to put a question or two in. Um, Adam, talk to me about the cookie list future and what you're doing about the cookie list future. Yeah, uh, th I mean, as everyone, early stage, still trying to figure out what the right mix of answers is for us. I think there's, you know, there's a few pillars within here. Um, even before we work out what the, you know, what we need to build, there's a lot of internal education to our leadership team on what to expect, um, you know, changes to the digital, you know, the digital marketing motion that they have expected or, you know, the specificity of how we can use third party audiences might change. So just getting everyone comfortable with what to expect in the coming years, especially as it relates to, you know, potentially having less data to report back on to the business. Um, and then as far as, you know, actually preparing for it, I would say we're, we, while we don't have, you know, a final answer, because I don't think anyone has a final answer as, you know, all the big players are still deciding what they're going to allow or not allow. Um, we're trying to push all of our existing strategic partnerships as much as we possibly can. Those players that we think are going to have some stake into what a future solution can be so um, that we can be, you know, first in line with those partners, either to test out new capabilities or to receive updates on, um, you know, say what Google is doing as best as we can get, you know, answers from Google, but that type of, you know, just deep partnership to, um, you know, have a variety of, of options. And I think that's the key point that we have a variety of potential answers to what the, you know, what we need to test from a buying standpoint, from a measurement standpoint, um, knowing that, you know, I don't think anyone fully knows which of those partner answers is going to be you know, a long-term solution or, you know, ultimately some of them will not pan out. So we have to keep our- Does it make, I mean, does it make endemic publishers, those kind of tech publishers we talked about earlier, does it make them more attractive vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Facebook or a Google or, or even a LinkedIn because context will matter so much more and first party data will matter so much more in a world without cookies? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to say yes, whether it, it's, a, it's a yes, but still, it's not undercutting what we need to do with the rest of the investment, but of course, those partners that are going to have their own first party data that potentially we can build some partnership with them to use that either actual first party data or even just contextual data. Um, yeah, I mean, I think whether it's those endemic partners or say some of the, the native distribution partners that also have their own suite of contextual information, wherever that context data sits, Certainly, I, I would agree there for, for a B2B advertiser like us, um, where we need to have that specificity at the very least at the context level, um, that's gonna be critical you know, versus say a Facebook where perhaps that, you know, they may, you know, we may not have that specificity. How are you feeling about the back half of the year? I mean, are you feeling highly optimistic? Do you think the world is gonna open up? Do you think business is gonna start roaring? Do you, or are, are you more, you know, kind of tepid than that, you know, where, where's your head at in terms of where you think the kind of pandemic cycle is right now in terms of what it'll do for your business? Yeah, I think from a business standpoint, there's a lot of, of optim optimism. I think there's, you know, a lot of, you know, just pure sales success that we're seeing in the, in the first part of the year. Um, from a personal standpoint, I, you know, I personally, I'm, while I'm optimistic, I you know, still have some trepidation of what could still happen and what could still change again. Um, but I think we're, you know, we're seeing from an investment standpoint, um, and we're actually a bit deeper into our year because our fiscal starts in November and we're, we're deep into planning for, for next year already. Um, you know, I think some of the you know, hope from an investment standpoint on what we can, what we can add back in is it's overall good news. So I, and I think we, you know, we're, we're thinking about in-person events for, you know, and we've, you know, the last, actually our, our Discover event um, is, is next week. This year, it'll be virtual again, but we're thinking about, you know, some happier versions of that, you know, six months down the line to start to bring customers back in person. I think that certainly is, is exciting, not just for the sales team, but for all of us just given, you know, what that will, what will reopen in terms of deeper customer conversations. 
you've been in this role six years, right? That's right. What, what, what have you learned in the, what have you learned in six years? What have I learned in six years? Oh, give me the one, give me one or two top things that you've learned. And, and then I've got some other questions about past six years, but go ahead. I would say one thing, which is both, I, I think it's largely indicative of just internal org structure, especially for a company like ours is how challenging it is to bring customer centric motions to not just our media buying, but you know, to, to marketing planning, you know, as well as we're, we're certainly a very product centric organization, which is, which is why this, this services transformation is so big for us if we're able to be successful on that. But, you know, purely from, you know, a media buying, you know, media strategy standpoint, I've spent many of those years, you know, trying to build the internal structure to move away from, you know, siloed product campaigns to more of a, you know, customer centric way of activating. Um, you know, given that most of our products and most of our campaigns are speaking to a lot of the same individuals, you know, it's not as if each of the products has its own unique customer set, um, but just organizational structure wise it's challenging even if, you know, even as we built you know, we, we did build that that notion you know perhaps about halfway into my my tenure here but keeping that alive keeping that you know from reverting back to you know product marketing teams kind of taking the lead in their you know in their silos it's an ongoing challenge and an ongoing conversation to you know keep that as a you know keep that focus um for the for the marketing organization, even you know, obviously the the buzzword of it, you know, no one's going to disagree with. But to actually prevent organizational changes from um, from reverting back, um, I think that has been a key learning for me. Uh, Keith Bowen, who's the chief revenue officer of Altice, he asks, "What do you think about the upfront, and do you participate in the upfront, and is it still relevant?" Um, I mean, I think our answer has to be taken with a grain of salt, given, you know, what we typically do from a, you know, linear standpoint. For us, it never really was a key part of our, our planning cycle. I mean, of course, we participated um, to hear any of the new announcements, but as far as committing investment, um, it's not something that we would typically do. Um, so I don't want to speak for, you know, other advertisers who have had more of a historical presence there. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been too big for us. Okay, a couple more questions. How do you approach emerging media channels and how do they factor into your overall strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a bit of a, you know, mixed story. We spoke a bit about some of the social platforms. I think we're obviously going to be slower than, you know, many of the you know, consumer brands at testing new social platforms not necessarily because we're scared or you know concerned about the brand safety aspect of being on there. I mean, sure, that might come into play, but more so it's just not critical from a business standpoint to be the first ones testing out um, some of the new platforms. With that said, from a you know technical capability standpoint, say like what we're building out in our programmatic stack from a data standpoint, from you know new you know new ad formats within um, you know, that can be bought within programmatic channels. I would say that's where we're certainly trying to push um, the envelope. And, you know, C you know, obviously CTV is not one of those channels anymore, but, you know, when it was, I think, at least as a B2B organization, we've been able to get, you know, the internal buy-in to be aggressive in, in building out, um, you know, strategies and, it, you know, kind of working in those emerging channels within, within that type of mindset. Um, the next question is, as a B, and I'm, I'm going to alter the question a little bit. The question is, as a B2B brand, how important is brand purpose and brand story? I, I know the answer is going to be very important. My question to you would be, how is it different as a B2B brand? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's perhaps different as a B2B brand because if without that, and I, I mean, you know, it's, I'm not going to discount any differences in the products themselves, but at least how, as far as how B2B brands speak about the products and you see, you know, say a 30 second spot for us versus, you know, any handful of the, you know, six to seven competitors from a layman standpoint, I think it, you know, kind of all can blur, blur together very easily. So without that brand purpose, without that brand positioning, I think we would, you know, we would lose probably the most important differentiator that we have 
I mean, of course, we're going to have the buyers who are, you know, focused on the product specs and that will be part of the decision. But I think getting our customers to buy into where we see the future of the industry, whether it's this, you know, services motion and building out these experiences um, to become more, you know, digital first and how, how our customers use our products. Um, yeah, I think those are going to be the longer term opportunities for us to really keep, you know, keep our, you know, current customers loyal and, you know, get our, you know, get other prospects to consider some type of transition to us. All right. Well, look, we've gone for about 30 minutes and I think we've gotten through some questions. Let me, uh, let me ask you, is there anything that I, I didn't ask that you want to talk about that kind of plays into this future of media conversation, future of advertising? Did I forget anything? Yeah, I would say going back to the, and you did, you did bring this up, so I just didn't address it, but on the cookie list conversation, yeah, I think one thing that I don't hear spoken about as much. And I, I've, I personally am ex excited about some of those changes because I do think it's an opportunity, not just to try and rebuild all of the data and platform architecture to keep the same types of targeting that we've you know, been able to use in the past. But I, I would rather it be, actually, I mean, in addition to that, I would want it to be a conversation on how are we thinking about what type of you know, advertising formats, content formats are actually, do our, do, does our audience want to hear from us? I think, um, you know, versus trying to rebuild what we had, there are a lot of flaws in what we had before from a, you know, creative format standpoint, overinvestment in say banner formats, really basic ad formats that have been around forever that at this point, I would question, you know, if that's something that is worth continuing. So I, you know, and pushing the internal team, but hopefully, you know, in talking with the industry at large, you know, whether it's how we bring in context to tell, you know, to tell a better advertising story, or if it's purely, you know, thinking about creative format production and what is actually going to break through to our audience. I think that is something that I would like to see as part of the conversation. Whereas I feel like most of the conversation on you know, the, the loss of cookies is how can we rebuild what we're yep. doing versus rethink the, you know, how we're telling our, our stories entirely. Well, this next question kind of plays in nicely to that. Many brands have dramatically reduced media budgets over the past year. How has your media plan adjusted? If your budget has been reduced, have you gotten more creative and efficient with your strategies? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a channel by channel conversation there. And in some cases, we're actually up um, um, year over year, not even just in compared to during 2020, but years prior. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly there's places where we have less investment, um, and I've had to get more creative on, on how we're, um, investing. I, mean, I think part of that has been one of the rationales for some of the in-housing work on, you yeah, as media, but, you know, some, some of the media budgets are going down. Can we be more efficient? if we were to do some of these pieces ourselves. I think one of our early success stories there has been around, you know, has been with, with social, um, you know, in, in the past, when we, you know, when we're working with a large agency group, some of our smaller markets, smaller countries have really had a hard time participating in that model. They just were never going to have the right levels of investment to drive enough impact and, you know, also pay for an agency um, scope at the same time, but as we're able to offer up some of those capabilities for social buys internally, we've been able to turn very, very small media budgets into some, you know, to a meaningful impact for a country of, of that size. So I think that's one area where I think, you know, has kind of, we've been able to just rethink how we're doing some of our, you know, some of our investment and drive impact with really small budgets in some places. Another question, a very specific one. How do you see in-game advertising as part of your media mix? That might be a better question for the consumer side of HP, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass along the question. Yeah, I don't have too much there. I would definitely say it's something that we've spoken about a lot and we've spoken with some of the large um, esports brands about potential brands um, integrations. Obviously, you know, they all have some type of IT infrastructure that is supporting their entire business. And I think there's a compelling story that we um, you know, could co-create together. Um, and on top of that, we know that IT buyers and gamers, those audiences do have 
a lot of overlap. So there's an audience there that is important to us. Whether we've gotten really deep into in-game advertising, it's not something that we've been able to do just yet, um, but it's, it's something that we are, are thinking about. All right, well, Adam, I can't thank you enough for participating in this. I really appreciate it. It was a far ranging conversation where I think we covered every aspect of your <laughs> business. Um, so thank you for taking the time today and I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course, appreciate it, John. Good to, good to talk with good you. Talk to you as well. I don't know, do we, it, is, does the monitor come back on? Jesse, hey, you're muted. Oh, whoa. Ooh, first time. Um, yeah, thanks so much, guys. That was awesome. Always great to kind of take a peek under the hood of those B2B brands. So really appreciate it, Adam. Thanks, John. Awesome conversation. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank Talk you. to you soon. Sweet. Awesome. Well, such a great conversation. Um, up next, we have the pleasure of having Candace Bixler, the uh, head of integrated media from Petco and Justin Gutschmidt from Premion, the uh, head of national sales. So welcome Candace and Justin. Um, while we wait for them, oh, perfect, Justin's hopping on. Hey, Justin, how's it going? Hey, really good, Jesse, how are you? Fantastic. That's good. We're running a little ahead of schedule today. This is great. <laughs> I know, we're moving fast, it's good, you know. <laughs> we got off a little early on a Thursday, can't come yeah. All right, sounds good. Is uh, is Candace here yet, or are we still waiting on her? I think we're waiting on her for a bit, so we can stall a little. Where are you uh, based out of? So I was a trendsetter. I'm based out of uh, Cleveland. Our offices in New York. Um, before the pandemic, this company let me work remote, and uh, and then everyone else worked remote, and it seemed like the normal thing to do. So <laughs> it nice was uh, it was a good situation. Um, yeah, so I'm based out of Cleveland. Awesome. You set the trends. Any uh, big plans for summer? I know things are opening up there. Yeah, we shall see. Uh, trying to get back out with the family, um, you know, the the whole um, idea of getting back out and going somewhere feels so good. Uh, it's it's just a matter of where at this point. So uh, we're still.